Okay, if you have your Bibles, we'll start in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, just a reminder, this week is um, the last week in February that we'll all kind of be together. And then next week, and I'll try to remind you on Thursday as uh, during the announcements that on Thursday, then we're going to split up for two weeks and we'll have uh, three different adult classes for two weeks. So we'll have the empty nesters. Uh, then I will be teaching on uh, dating in here and then down in the college chapel will be basically uh, rearing of young children, rearing of young children. And I would say can kind of 10 years old and under because uh, you have you have many moons uh, before you have to worry about my topic. All right. And, and we'll record it and you can uh, we'll be teaching on it again someday. All right. But Second Timothy uh, chapter Three. Most of us know this passage, but I'm using it as a kind of a springboard in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So you, you might say, well, why are you starting out with that? And the reason I'm starting out with that is because our topic tonight is uh, when trouble hits your family, all right? When trouble hits your family, and we're specifically looking at kind of the teen years in regards to this. So why are we reading this passage? Well, almost all of us agree with the theory. The theory is that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The theory is that this book is good enough for anything I face. That's in theory. Okay? Because sometimes in practice, when something hits, we don't go to it. And that's what we have to be careful of. We have to be careful because this book is enough. God is enough to meet our needs. And you may not understand all that's going on, but God is enough to meet our needs. Um, true godliness and the wisdom found in God's word is the key. The Bible was written to teach us how to relate properly to God, to one another. And so what I would encourage you at the beginning is reject the so-called wisdom that has flooded into churches, into the world through the vehicle of psychology and parents now look basically to Christian psychologists as the experts in how to raise their children instead of looking at God's book. And that's what we have to look at. So this evening, then quickly, as I've learned, when I have a number of points, we only have so many minutes per point. All right. So we got to try to get through them. So and, and when trouble comes into your life or when a teen is in trouble, what should we do? So I'm going to divide it into two areas. What are some things to avoid and what are some things to accept and do? What should we avoid? So number one, what should we avoid? Avoid jumping to conclusions quickly. Avoid jumping to conclusions quickly. And what do we mean by that? Well, let me give you a couple of verses. Proverbs 14, verse 29. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. Hastiness is never, it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be in, our, uh, in, the, in the Christian being, basically. Hastiness, when something is all of a sudden forcing you and this hastiness, hastiness uh, as far as conclusions, uh, hastiness and decision making, we need to just back away and you'll see um, and some things to accept. This is what I believe we should do. But some things to avoid is avoid jumping to a conclusion quickly. Proverbs 21, 5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but everyone that is hasty only to want. Seest thou man hasty in his words? This is Proverbs 29, 20. There is more hope of a fool than of him. We got to be careful of just jumping to some quick conclusion, um, which is back away from it. We'll take our time. We'll pray about it. We'll work on it. Uh, but remember that even a teenager um, 
We got their whole life. We got their whole life. We just, we just back, back down a little bit, chill, okay, and uh, God will help us. So avoid jumping to a conclusion quickly. Secondly, avoid bashing authority. Avoid bashing authority. What you will find is authority will make mistakes. You know why? Because you do. All right, and you know, you don't want us bashing you, but you make mistakes and you want us to be gracious with it. So make sure when authority makes a mistake, you just be gracious a little bit. And uh, let me ask you this. So at work, does your boss make mistakes? So do you just throw everything around, flip the desk over? Well, then probably you're not going to be there long. You'll be fired and then you'll be fired and then you'll be fired. Well, not in today's society because you can probably pick it outside. All right, and then you can have you know some rep come in and he can he can fire that guy because he actually fired you for a right cause and in our society everything is flip-flopped okay but avoid bashing authority God created authority God created that so when you start tearing it all down that's what's happened in our nation all right now a policeman you can't have that or even uh, now now I guess I mean, I, I was driving down or, or driving in town today, and they were interviewing. They're interviewing some kid out in Seattle or something like that. And uh, a mom came in illegally in 2000, whatever. And then uh, she was in 2009. She was put in jail in 2013. This and this and this. Uh, but now she's had two children. The one's 20-something years old. The one is 16. And th they were interviewing the children. And say, you know what? It's just, you know what? Every, I mean, the guy, 20 years old. You know what? Every teenager needs their mother. I'm like, I agree. So ship her back too. All right, if you want to be with your mama, then go back where all you belong. But now all of a sudden, there's no law. There's no law. No authority. So every man did, does that which is right in their own eyes. That is not a good motto. So God establishes authority, and authority establishes rules. Now guess what? If you were running a school, you would have some weird rules too. All right, you may not like peanut butter. And so, you know what? The kitchen no longer is ever allowed to serve peanut butter. Then guess what? If that's, if that's the rule for the school, now I could crab and I can complain, say, you know what, I like peanut butter. But in the school, I'm not gonna have peanut butter. You know why? Because somebody establishes rules. And it doesn't really have to have all kinds of rhyme or rhyme. You know what, I don't understand it. Who cares? You know, now all of a sudden I have to have full understanding of everything? No, authority is established. God establishes that. So when something happens, your first reaction is to say, Psh, you know what, those teachers. Because you know what your, your teenager is going to do? Just give them a little time and they're going to say, my parents, you won't be there. But they're saying it to their teens. And they may be, and to the youth pastor, which we're going to try to back you, but your kid is then saying, my parents, where did they learn that? It could be in home. Now also, what am I, all right, as a staff, we follow these same thing. I'm not going to jump to a conclusion, because guess what I know about people? They're sinners. So just because a teenager comes in my office and says, my parents are wicked people, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. But like, really? What are they doing? Write it down. And right, I'm not going to jump to conclusions either. So you don't. Okay. What amazes me is that your 12-year-old has much more wisdom than my principal. Oh, oh yeah. Because you say, no, 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 no. But because just in conversation with me, what you said is the principal did this, and you're not in class. Who's the one in class? Who's the one in the hallway? The 12-year-old. So the 12-year-old goes home to you, and he obviously knows everything because he's very wise. And then he explains it to you, and then all of a sudden you're in, like, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I don't know what's going on. All right? But your 12-year-old may be just as immature. All right? Maybe he's just a 12-year-old. 
You know, and a 12-year-old is a 12-year-old. They're not, they don't know everything. And so I'm going to try not to jump to conclusions. You do the same thing. Then I'm going to back authority. People, people get irritated at me because somebody, somebody comes to me about the principle. I believe my principle. Like, why do you do that? Because we hired him. All right, and I think he does a good job, and just because you don't like something, and then I'll say, hey, so did you talk to him? That's usually my first question. Did you talk to him? Oh, well, I, I was going to come to you. Well, then go talk to him, you wimp. Go talk to him. You don't come to me and then have me, you know, don't throw the monkey on my back. You know, keep your little monkey, all right, and then you go and dump it on him, all right, but you don't want to do it. Oh, I'm trying to get you mad. No, I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because I'm not going to be hasty. I'm like, yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. So what do you want me to do? Nah. Okay, someday. Why? Because, you know what? You didn't seem to want to follow the Bible and go to somebody. Go to them. Just go to them and say, hey, you know what? My and say it. My 12-year-old came and said that you beat them merc uh, mercilessly or whatever without mercy and in front of all these people and there was blood dripping down. And you'd be like, um, you know, and, and that's why I told someone recently, all right, not recently, but in the last year or so, I said, you know, if you came and were saying that about me, I would probably believe you. All right, I would be like, yeah, I know myself. I'm a spaz. But have you met our principal? <laughs> All right? You know what I mean? I mean, that, you talk about easygoing. Nothing rattles them. I'm like, have you, met, have you sat down with them? All right, because be like, yeah. I, I don't seem like, ooh, poof, poof. Right? He's doing ninja moves on him. I'm not. Sorry, it, it didn't happen. Okay? So avoid jumping to conclusions quickly. Avoid bashing authority. These are all things that you're avoiding when, when, when teens have a problem. I'm trying to avoid these things. Avoid jumping to conclusion quickly. Avoid bashing authority. Then the third thing, avoid taking the teen problem personally as a parent. Does that make sense? Avoid taking the teen problem personally as a parent. So I'm dealing with you as a parent. I'm not mad at you. Now, I may be mad at your teenager, but I like you, okay? But avoid taking it personally yourself. I know that is your offspring. I mean, I was down with the Reardons, and I was talking. There's, there's a balance. Remember, I've tried to help you in understanding there's a balance between parental responsibility and personal responsibility. Your 15-year-old knows what they're doing. So let me get on the 15-year-old, and you don't be like, oh, I mean, why do you not like me? I didn't say anything to you. I'm talking to your teenager. Let me deal with the teenager and let us hammer. We're on the same side. We're on the same side. So don't take it personally. Let's team up together. Let the youth pastor team. Let's all team up together, and guess what? We're, 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 we're trying to build a good young person. That's what we're trying to do. So let's work together on it and then not take it personally. And that's not going to always be, that's not always going to be easy. Why? Because that's your flesh and blood. And your flesh and blood, there's something in us that we think that, man, they're perfect. They never do anything wrong. Yes, they do. You know it because you're, you're at home ripping their heads off all the time. All right, so here they are as a teenager, but as soon as somebody else, it is kind of a, it's, it's like a family thing, you know what? We can all rip each other, you know, to shreds. I mean, and that happens probably with your you know, sibling, you know, you got, you got brothers and sisters, and I mean, they fight nonstop, but somebody else says something, oh, what's up? <laughs> it's like, oh, wait a minute, now you guys like each other? What happened? Okay, well, that kind of happens as parents, too. Like, I mean, we're on them, we're saying they're bad, and then the youth pastor comes and says they're bad. What? What? Well, you're picking, I'm not picking on you. I am picking on the team, yes. All right, but they did wrong, so don't take it personally. All right, so what do we avoid? Avoid jumping to a conclusion, avoid bashing authority, avoid taking that teen problem personally. Then, oh, here's the fourth one. Avoid feeling sorry 
for your team that's in trouble. This is what some of you do. All right? In fact, I did not know some of this uh, until a couple parents revealed this to me. I've tried to, all right, after 25 years of working with teenagers, you would think that some knowledge does sink in. And I've learned more and more that we have to work together as parents. We have to. So um, there's even been teenagers just in the last six months that we've worked on a lot. And guess what I do? We have a lot of meetings with the parents. And normally, I will not be hasty. And, and the parents know that I've been dealing with. And Pastor Parrish will tell them, pray about it. Pray about it. Because if that parent comes back and they're like, you know what, I, ain't, I don't like this. I'm not going to do it. More than likely, I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because your teenager will go up hating this church. Because who's the one punishing them? The church. The church. All right? And if you feel sorry for your teenager, you know what? I'm going to back out of it. Why? Because you can have your rebel. And I'll preach the snot out of them from the pulpit. You guarantee that. Just come Sunday mornings, all right, where I'm irritating everybody, okay? But guess what? I'll preach the snot out of them, all right, from right here. But you know what? You don't want the discipline? Mm -mm. Is that your call, parent? That's your call. It's your child. And you feel all sorry for them. You're like, oh, you know what? The church thinks that about you. But guess what? I, oh, my word. You talk about raising a rebel. That's exactly what you're building. So don't feel all sorry for them. Have you gotten in trouble before? Maybe even with God? And God's put you through a hard time? You know it's a hard time. That's what it is. It's just a hard time. And what I don't need is all kinds of people coming up and like, oh, oh, you know what? God's been mean to you. I don't need that. What I need is, hey, get in the book. Get right with God. I mean, get stronger. Take that discipline. And understand, we talked about this when we were preaching on bitterness. What does Hebrews 12 tell us? No chastening is joyous. So understand this with your young person. Whenever they get in trouble, they're probably going to come home and say, Dad, this just doesn't seem fair. Now, if they came home, and let's say we kicked them out of school, and then, you know, and we, we beat them until they're bloody, all this type of stuff, and they're, I mean, they're just, and, and they come home and like, man, I like this. All right, you got a problem, too. All right, I would be very concerned, okay? But let's say someone gets kicked out of school. They should be upset. But as a parent, they're like, oh, you know what? Let's go to Great America. <laughs> go to Great America? What in the world? But some of you feel so, hey, let's go out to eat. No! You're hurting it. You're messing up the discipline. Let's work together. But working together doesn't mean that the church is the bad guy and you are Santa Claus. All right? It's not, it's a, we're, not a, we're not a divorce situation here where, you know, this parent, you know, you work with divorce situation and mom and dad are basically having a, uh, a runoff who's going to be voted in as the best parent. So every time, oh, this, what did you do last weekend? Oh, 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 oh dad bought me a car. Oh, oh, all right, so then they go to the moms. And, and, you know, and, and dad's like, so what did mom do? Oh, oh, I got, I got my own jet. <laughs> oh, all right, so it's back and forth. All right, we're not trying to do that. All right, it's not, we're not in competition to see who's going to be the greatest in the teen, in the teen world. Who's going to get the medal? We're working together. So don't ruin this situation. All right, so avoid jumping to a conclusion. Avoid uh, taking the teen problem personally. Avoid bashing authority. Avoid feeling sorry for your teen that is in trouble. Then the last one, avoid advice from the whole world. All right, just so you know, God gave you pastors, all right, and I'm, I'm the senior pastor. I believe in that. I believe in, in a, uh, a, a lead pastor. I believe in that. I believe that's biblical, okay? But God has given you pastors that you voted in because you trust them. 
According to Hebrews 13, 17, they watch for your soul. Just so you know, the members in this church, they're not responsible to watch for your souls. They're not. It's not their responsibility. It's my job. It's the job of the pastoral staff. Why? You voted them in for that. That's what you, you may not understand the weight of it when we say, hey, let's vote this person in as a pastoral, but that's what you asked for. So then trust them. So don't run to everybody, oh, you know what? I have a friend on Facebook. Hey, my teen's having a problem. Now, that's stupid anyways. Let's have the whole world know that I've got, you know, a uh, jerk teen. All right, talk about, you know, you're the one all worried about their self-esteem. Let's, let's send it out to the world. I got jerk in my house. And that's really dumb. And then let's see what they want to do. Who cares? So are, are, they, are they the ones that are going to um, sit, in, sit in the office with you and pray for you? No. You know what? Their answer probably took them like 17 seconds to throw down there. They're probably at work like, all right, just whipping it back at you. They're not praying for your kids. They're not caring for your kids because it's not their responsibility. But guess what? The staff here, we do take it serious. And your kids, I, all my staff, I tell them, we talked about it over and over. We try to make lists and we pray over them. Anybody that's responsible underneath, uh, underneath each, each group that we're in charge of, we're praying for them. We're calling out their name before God. Why? Because that is our responsibility. So don't go to the whole world. Because the world, I can tell you this, is loony. They're loony. Just listen to the news for four minutes a day, and you will know it. All right, you will know it. So some things to avoid, some things to accept then and do. First, got 10 minutes here to finish up. Look at that, we're doing well. Run, number one, when teen problem, and this is kind of chronologically, it's not all chronological, but this is number one. First thing, run to the Lord. Don't run to me. Run to the Lord. That's what you have to do. So what does that mean? Okay. You, you take the time necessary. Someone recently was, problem came up, and they were like, well, you know what? Maybe I'll have my, I'll have my uh, a teen with me. I was like, no, uh-uh, not right now. First, I want you and God then let's include the young person. You'd say, oh, I mean, they need... No, no, no. You need God first. Why? Because God has an answer for you. He'll give you direction. Otherwise, I don't believe the Bible. What does John 15, 16, 17 tell us? What has God given us? If I go away, what will he give me? The comforter? And he will guide me into some truth? No, 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 you know that's wrong. What, is he, what will he guide me into? All truth. He will teach you. He will guide you. He will help you. But he can't do it if you're not talking to him and if you do not have a prolonged time. You know what my first thought would be? And it should be? Study it out. I think that would be an appropriate time to fast. Mm-hmm. Study about it. Because what's more important? You read what a fast is for. Oh, that's what it's for. Fast, I believe, are very specific when you study in the Bible. You can do corporate, but when it's individually, usually it's for a specific need when you study it in the Bible. Well, that right there, my teenager, the devil's got a hold of him. You bet. I'm going to be I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be fast. That would be a time I don't care. I don't care about vacation days or whatever. I will take a personal day and lose money to be with God. Why? Because nothing is more important. Because I have to run to God. So number one, I run to God. 
I will lose, and, and, and this is, I'm saying it as far as myself, I would lose money, I would lose vacation time, I would lose my house. Because that's not, that's material. I'd, I'd live in a tent to keep my kids. And that should be your heartbeat. Why? Because it's very important. God gave them to you, and God, I must be messing, I'm, I'm doing something off. And I know God has the answer. So I run to the Lord. Number one, I run to the Lord. Number two, then, <laughs> there is no, you may say, wait a minute, what does this have to do with it? There is no sinless perfection. You say, wait a minute, I'm going to accept and do this. All right, no, but what I mean by that, I'm going to accept the idea that there's no sinless perfection. So what does that mean for your teenager? They're probably going to sin. <sighs> and all of a sudden you believe in sinless perfection? All right, your teenager's going to mess up. But somehow, when they're a little kid, you know, they're three years old, four years old, five years old. I mean, it's like continual. I know they're a sinner. You know why? Because... Yeah, every minute they're a sinner. Right? Every, I think even more than that. Right? I know they're a sinner, but all of a sudden at 12 years old, they're not a sinner anymore. Oh, yeah, they are. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, foolishness is still bound in their heart. Okay? And you've got to understand, there's no sinless perfection, so guess what's going to happen when they're 14? They're going to sneak around and do something stupid in your house. <gasps> I thought, I thought that we had a trust thing. Really? With your 14-year-old? Right, you didn't think that they were going to sneak around to do something? All right, they're a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, 18. There's no sinless perfection. So if I understand that, if I understand that theologically, then it's got to sink down to my heart. It's got it's to be in my head that I understand, you know what's going to happen? My teenager is going to sin. Then that helps me not to be hasty in my decision. Make, ah, you sin! Oh, really, Dad? Really? So is that something new? All right, guess what? Uh, and I'm not, we shouldn't have our teens doing that conversation back to us. But really, they, they really could say that. Oh, uh, so Dad, so do I come to a place where I never sin? We know that's not true. So when they do something stupid, guess what? There's no sinless perfection. But then, here's our next one, things to accept and do. I'm going to... I'm going to run to the Lord. I'm going to understand there's no sinless perfection. Then I'm going to realize God has to change the heart. You can't do it. You say, wait a minute, but if I develop this program and I put them in this program and they say, you know, every second of every day, I've got it all planned out and you will do this. That's fine. But sometime you're not going to be there. God has to change their heart. And that may take years. I was talking to someone recently. All right, and there's, uh, there's been young people that have grown up here. And, man, in, in their teen years, they do okay. But then they just kind of, what I call, just stagnate. And sometimes they stagnate for seven years, eight years, all right, nine years. You're like, man, what is up? Come on, do something for the Lord. Then all of a sudden, it's like a fire gets lit. And man, they're just taking off. You know, everybody has different stages of growth. Let God do it. Let God do it. Because when God does it, everything changes. Everything changes when God does it. So you, you can't force it. You say, well, I'm going to make them do it. You know, go ahead. I'm just telling you, as a teenager, you force it, force it, force it, force it. At 18 or at 19, the, the force is gone. Okay? And guess what's going to happen? I'm done. I'm through. And they have a choice then. So be patient. Okay? Realize God has to change the teen. You can't change your teen's heart. You can't do it. God has to do that work. And then also along that idea of realizing God has to change our heart, let the medicine do the work. Now, what do I mean by that? The chastening, physically, what happens? Like, uh, let's say I get a bad, a bad illness. 
I, we were, we've been praying for Fred. Fred finally gets to come home, all right, but guess what still has to happen? It's been at least a month. We've been praying for him. He's been in a hospital almost a month. It's not all back to normal. Guess what has to happen? The medicine has to do its work. So physically, we understand that. Spiritually, it's the same. Let the medicine do its work. So it's not going to, sometimes when a teen, just think, if a teen gets kicked out of school or a teen has a, a bad rebellious streak, and you, you expect in four weeks some antibiotics, spiritual antibiotic to come in and, oh, oh, now I'm super teen. Oh, no, let the medicine do its work, and it may take a year. But just be patient. Let the medicine do its work. Be patient. Hang on there. Do you trust God? Do you have faith enough? That's what we should have. So realize God has to change the team. Then uh, along, this, this goes back to not bashing authority and not getting advice from the whole world. This is something to accept and do. Rely on God-given help. We already kind of talked about it, so we don't have to dwell on it long. But in Hebrews 13, 17, it says that they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. No, that, that does weigh on me. I will give an account for every young person that grows up here. That's why I, I, I work hard at it. I try. I want to know the kids' names. I want to call them out in prayer. You know why? I'll answer to God. I'm going to stand before God for every little kid that's in our church. Even the little bus kids. I try to get to know them and, and shake their hands and try to get to know some of the kids, and that's why I, I like going down. I love our children's ministry. Why? Because I'm going to give an account for that. So it does weigh on us. It weighs on us because we believe the Bible. So rely on God-given help. Okay, then the last thing. It's our last one. Do the things you know are right. This is what I say, when, when trouble comes into your life, and especially in a family problem, I call it the, the fog. The fog comes in. You can hear the horn. Mm, mm. You, that's all, and you're like, ah, what's going on? What's going on? Well, God-given helps there to help you. Grab onto them, okay? You may not be able to see a lot of things. It may not be clear. It may not be un any understanding like we talked about with Job. Job didn't understand a lot of things. And really, God didn't. God never came to him and explained it all. But this is what, there are some things in the Bible you know are right to do. So guess what I can do? I can't see a lot of things, but what I know I should do is I need to read my Bible. I need to pray. I need to be in church. I need to discipline my kids like I should. I know all of that, so I'm going to keep doing that. That's called faith. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Sometimes I can't see it, God. I don't think that this teenager, I don't think that this young person, I don't think it's going to happen. Really. As I've told our staff, and as I've told some of you, your team gets in trouble, and my staff, I believe we have this philosophy. I believe in a God of all hope. All hope. I may not be able to see. I may come to you and say, man, this is really bad. But I can never come to you and say, there's never any hope. You know why? Because then I'm not a man of faith. Because it shouldn't be that any of us should ever be saved. Never. It should be that, well, then let's just cash it in. Let's just cash it in. But guess what? God is a God of all hope. And so you've got to hang on to that. Why? For your kids' sake, they need to see and I may not understand everything, God, and I know my child right now is having a tough time, but God, you have all the answers, and he is a God of all hope. Now, is it true that some young people and some people reject God? Yes, but it's not his fault because he is a God of all hope because this is what always happens. 
the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he's willing that all come to repentance. You know what that means? Anytime that team turns and raises a hand, faster, faster than you can sneeze, guess what? God's hand's right there and pulling them up. That's our God. He's God of all hope. So when trouble hits our lives, and this applies to sometimes even our lives, but specifically we're looking at a teen. When a problem comes in, there's things to avoid, but there's things to accept and do. We need to make sure that we approach it spiritually. That's why we go to God's word. That's why we started out with 2 Timothy 3, because all scripture, I can go to this book. Some people get irritated. Remember, I've, I've had people now in years of ministry, you know what they're griped to me? I've had, I've had pastors say this to me. You know what? You're always going to the Bible. Thank you. Because it's the only authority I got. It's the only hope I can give you. Because somebody somewhere, if they're, if they're in this flesh, you know what's going to happen? They're going to let you down. But this book, I can tell you this for centuries now, for thousands of years, God gave this to us, and it never returns void. It'll last forever. He is the God of all hope. All right, we'll take prayer requests now.